and welcome to another edition of Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham, where Team Needham discusses everything healthcare. I'm your host, Sean Needham, and I am streaming live from the Team Needham podcast studio, and I am super excited to have Kelly Fulcrod back on our uh, midweek podcast today. She is going to be talking about antidepressants and tapering off of them. As you guys know, um, one of the class of drugs I've talked about that I would never, ever recommend or never, ever go on myself. Um, it's antidepressants. Um, I don't believe when you look at the studies that the antidepressants are effective um, for depression. And I think they have lots of side effects and they're difficult to come off of. So we're going to be talking about that. And Kelly, welcome to our show. Thank you so much for having me. So tell us a little bit about your history and how you got started in talking about antidepressants and tapering off of them. Yeah, so I have been working in the mental health field for 23 years now. Um, never really planned on becoming a psychotherapist. The plan was always to be involved in clinical research. And so even during my graduate training, I was working in um, university level research labs, studying the brain and the nervous system, all of that. And then upon graduation, my first job was working in an inpatient psychiatric hospital that was bringing depression drugs to market. So I was actually working for drug companies that were testing out depression drugs um, on innocent victims. <laughs> and what I saw there was astounding. That was my first like incredible eye-opening experience to the corruption in the industry um, because I knew how university level research happened. I had been a published author, right? I knew what the scientific method was. And then when I saw these industry sponsored, what, how they were doing research, I was like, wow, so you can cherry pick the, the, the people, the patients that you want, uh, and then and then get rid of data that doesn't support your product, right? It wasn't research. <laughs> and um, that was astounding to me. And the other like eye-opening experience was um, we were giving people an experimental drug. There was no follow-up. There was no solution if they had adverse reactions. Um, and we were only studying this for three months before the FDA approval process would bring these drugs to market. So um, most psychiatrists will tell you to take this drug for at least six Six months, uh, two years if you have, you know, reoccurrent depression. And so the fact that we were not studying these longer than three months made me pause, which means we have no empirical evidence on what this drug does to the nervous system or brain long term. There's none. Nobody's researched it. So the American public, I mean, I can speak for Americans, right? But our culture is the guinea pig of this drug. And if you trace um, at least psychiatry within the pharmaceutical industry, this is their pattern. They've done this three times. So it started with the barbiturates. They said, this is safe and effective, easy to get off of. It's the wonder drug for housewives, right? Then they, yeah. then they backpedaled and they said, oh, this is really hard to withdraw from. Sorry. Then we had the benzodiazepines. Yep. Same thing. Safe and effective. Good for everybody. Uh, just like tobacco and cigarettes. You can do it while you're pregnant. <laughs> Target yep. the housewives backpedaled. Oh, we're sorry. This is really hard to withdraw from. Uh, now, third class, SSRIs. Safe and effective, easy, easy to withdraw from. You know the drill, right? You can't trust these people anymore after three iterations. And now we have um, gabapentin, right? And this class of drugs, now there's this um, rush of research showing same thing. Highly addictive, hard to withdraw from. So that's what I'm here. I really just want to educate people on the truth about these drugs. Uh, and what we were talking about is like there is a major placebo effect because if, if somebody in a white coat's telling you this is going to make you feel better here, right? That in and of itself is a big part <laughs> of how these actually have efficacy, um, the other thing, and we'll get into this, is, is the closest molecular structure we know of to an SSRI is a stimulant. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Co cocaine, right? And yep. so cocaine is going to make anybody feel better or happier. Short term. <laughs> Short term, sure. right? Um, and so that's kind of what we're working with. 
Um, and again, I have research articles to back up everything I'm stating today on this podcast if people want to do the reading. Um, but the biggest thing that kind of is a revolution to this industry is Joanna Moncrief and her article that she authored in two, 2022 in a major psychiatry journal, the Journal of Molecular Psychiatry, um, peer-reviewed, right? And it was a meta-analysis basically disproving the chemical imbalance theory of depression. So she gave a science that has not been refuted that shows there is no such thing of low serotonin causing depression. That's not true. But but the, the pharmaceutical manufacturers and, and marketing companies have convinced all of humanity that depression is caused by low serotonin, even though now we have science that says that's actually false. It's always been a theory. And then that theory has been disproven. So that's kind of how we enter this conversation is that we've been misled about depression in, in the first place and then given mind altering chemicals um, that are notoriously painful to stop. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and let's just back up a little bit with the science of how the SSRIs were approved. Yeah. When I was in pharmacy school 30 plus years ago, um, I was kind of questioning them then, but you know, I was indoctrinated learning some, lots of good things in pharmacy school with all these great studies and researchers and all this kind of stuff. So I was a little bit more gullible or a lot more gullible, I should say. So even though when I was reading about the studies that in the studies of the first SSRI and even the subsequent ones, the studies kind of replicated themselves. Prozac was the first SSRI and 45% of the people that were depressed responded to placebo. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember the numbers that responded to um, the active drug, but it wasn't much higher. Yeah. Um, so that being said, is it like you say, the white coat syndrome, you called it or something. Mm -hmm. Somebody tells you to take something for depression. It works. Sure. It could just be a placebo effect. That's right. Yeah. Now fast forward you know, 30 plus years later, and we see people that have been on SSRIs, the same one, even though they're, I, most of them are only indicated, I think FDA approved for six months, maybe two years, yeah. um, as far as labeling goes, but yeah. we see people on them for 30 plus years. Yeah. You know, and, and people say, well, when I take it, it makes me feel better. Well, it might, but like you say, so does cocaine short term. Yeah. So with alcohol short term, you get to forget about all your problems. Right. You know, but that doesn't mean it's fixing the issue. Right. Yeah. That's so right. And, right. And now we know how hard it is to get off of those SSRIs. So why don't you tell us some stories about, about people that have had try, side effects trying to get off of them? Yeah. So I want to, I mean, I have, I could talk for hours and hours, um, but want to start by like going back to the fluoxetine or the Prozac that was the first, you know, wonder drug of the SSRIs because they were researching um, the MAOI inhibitors and the TCAs, right? Those were the old school atypical antidepressants and the, the side effect profile was so high, hardly people couldn't stay on them for years, right? right. So that they, what they were studying was actually antihistamines, which I find very curious. Um, and the, the, that is how they got the patent for the, the fluoxetine was through antihistamines because they noticed a mood benefit through antihistamines. So, so more on that later when we get to more withdrawal. I didn't know that. But that is important. Um, and um, and so first, I just want to read really quickly. What are the just the side effects of when you start the medication? And then we'll go to the side effects of withdrawal. The side effects of withdrawal are actually much worse than being on the drug. Um, but the, the known side effects are weight gain, anxiety, dry mouth, headaches, drowsiness, insomnia, nausea, tremors, feeling of dissociation or not like yourself, personality changes, dizziness, addictions, gastrointestinal issues such as diarrhea, vomiting, agitation, sexual dysfunction, emotional blunting, numbing of affect. This is why people feel better is they're numb to their emotions. They don't feel their emotions anymore. I mean, uh, they, I, I'm just going to, I'm going to stop you right there, Kelly. These side effects, <laughs> they, correlate, they correlate with cocaine. Yeah. I know. Seriously. <laughs> so keep, keep going. I know. Well, I want to really, these, <clears throat> these two are really important. Sexual dysfunction. Yep. And then what we have called PSST, 
there, I've got resources on this. This is called post SSRI sexual dysfunction. So not only does it make you have an inability to orgasm while you're on the drug or erectile dysfunction, even when you get off of the drug cases, I've seen somebody 10 years later, I've seen it from up to six months to 10 years where they cannot have sex. It's not that they don't have a low libido. It's that they're, it does not work anymore. <laughs> so that's, that's, disturbing. If I, if I were really going to question this industry, I would wonder if this was a form of some sort of sterilization or something. Um, well, but more on that later. You gotta wonder. Maybe it was just an unknown, unintended side effect. Um, but this is the biggest one, uh, is the black box warning. Um, that the FDA, this is the strictest uh, FDA regulation that they have to put. It increases homicidal and suicidal ideation. This risk is higher in teenagers and children. So the fact that we're going to get, we're going to, a suicidal client comes to me and I'm going to suggest, hey, take this pill that might increase suicidality. It's ludicrous. And and they'll say in the two to three weeks that you're starting an antidepressant, the, the mainstream psychiatrist will say, oh, you might feel worse before you feel better for two to three weeks as your, uh, as your serotonin is up regulating. And what I've seen clinically is, yes, people get more anxious, people get more impulsive, people get uh, more violent as they're up, up dosing on an antidepressant. Um, again, I, I think that is, I don't think that means the medicine is kicking in. I think that's what's happening um, to the neural pathways in the brain um, as, you're, as you're starting that. So the other big side effect is serotonin syndrome. So I've seen this clinically more than once. It's a medical emergency. It's very dangerous. You can have this when polypharmacy is happening, when you're on multiple SSRIs at the same time, or you're taking another drug that interacts with that to increase the serotonin, or functional medicine doctors who don't know enough prescribing things like 5-HTP in addition to a SSRI, it's terrible. Oh, the other thing I've seen is people experimenting with psychedelics, uh, with the psychedelic that actually increases serotonin. So ayahuasca, um, psilocybin, these are things that work on the 5-HT2 receptor already. And if you've already got the, the SSRI in general, you can create serotonin syndrome while somebody's on a psychedelic, which is, I would never recommend for anybody. Um, uh, so those are just those are just um, when you're starting the drug, and um, what people don't realize, and this is what I really want you know the masses to understand, is that this is an epidemic. Uh, we have 40 million Americans on SSRIs, which is 15 percent of the American population. Wow. Which, if if we were to have some kind of shortage in in the drug supply and all of a sudden people went into SSRI withdrawal, we'd have 15% of the population that would likely be disabled if they've been on these medications more than a year. The, the, the ability to withdraw gets harder and harder the longer you are on the drug. And after six months is when you can start to have withdrawal symptoms. Um, so what happens is, is people will listen to their doctors about how to taper. And I want to really go into the tapering process and protocols. These doctors are not, these doctors are trained how to start you on the medication, but they have no training on how to de-prescribe or get you off of the medication. And, um, and look, their vested interest is to keep you on the pills because that's their whole stick. That's their whole, you know, that's what they do. And so I know what I'm saying could, could be, kind of hurtful or offensive to some people where your whole career is based on prescribing these medications. I don't think a lot of these doctors are intentionally trying to harm people. I really don't. I just think that their education is coming from the pharmaceutical industry, which has a vested interest in keeping long-term uh, customers. Well, let me, let me, yeah. let me uh, <laughs> comment on that. Being, yeah. a being a pharmacist, my wife being a pharmacist, um, you know, it, it, it's the same for most pharmacists. I mean, you've got a vested interest in keeping people on these drugs. It's what keeps you in business. Right. I will tell you, but Janet and I, 20 years or 20 plus years ago, realized that what we were doing was not helping people and it was unethical um, because you just give somebody another drug, another drug for X, Y, Z disease, usually a made up diagnosis. Honestly, you know, drug companies are good about making up diagnosis so they can find a drug to treat it. Um, AD, ADHD, that's a good one. IBS, that's another good one. Totally. Both ES diagnoses that yeah. have nothing to do with, with a drug deficiency. That's for sure. Right. <laughs> yeah. 
So, um, and backing up to the to the doctor prescribing it, you're you're, you're right. That's one of the things that they have the power to do. Mm -hmm. um, they have the power license to prescribe a legend drug. Mm -hmm. So, if you don't need a legend drug anymore, you don't need a doctor necessarily. But I will tell you this: if you're a good doctor or you're a good pharmacist. And you tell people the truth. You tell patients the truth that diet, exercise, sleep, your lifestyle is what matters for your mental health and your physical health. You don't lack some drug. You can make a living. My wife and I are perfect examples of that. Yes. We are two pharmacists that do not believe in most long-term drug therapy to treat chronic disease, especially if it's lifestyle related. Mental illness, mostly. I'm going to say this, Kelly. There are small examples a small, smaller subset of patients that they have some serious issues and, and they probably need to be medicated with some things, but it's definitely not 15% of Americans. Right. That's right. So um, go ahead. There's my spiel. So, <laughs> you and your wife for, you know, changing course and for showing up differently in your career and speaking truth that takes courage. Um, and we need more professionals like you. <laughs> we do. Um, because people, we're in the dark ages still. People don't know because there's just been so much protection for the industry um, and censorship. Uh, I do think, Kelly, one thing that's good about COVID is it exposed the corruption. It's true. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of people that are waking up like, wait a minute. I'm going to question this entire thing. I yeah. mean, you know, I mean, I do. Yeah. Just like, just like. I just don't, I don't believe in most drugs, drug company studies anymore. How, how can you seriously? Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. So let's talk about tapering off. We talked about some of the side effects. Let's talk about tapering off. So I want to just kind of give you kind of what, what has not worked and then, and then what we have now in terms of MDs, professionals, you know, who are, who, are, who are leading this movement, right, this pioneer movement of what we call a uh, psychiatric drug withdrawal. Now, I will say that, you know, I, in conversing with different psychiatrists throughout my career, I've been told more than once that I'm not allowed to call it withdrawal. Uh, but I'm going to continue to call it withdrawal because yeah. there's no other term for it. I've been corrected and said, you have to call it discontinuation syndrome. And I say potato, potato, because what we're talking about is withdrawal. You know, I got, I, I'm sorry. I've got to interrupt you. <laughs> I, I guarantee you, I would almost guarantee you knowing, knowing the drug company industry, I would almost guarantee you. They made up that name discontinuation <laughs> syndrome. I guarantee you that is their made up name. It is. And, and like we were kind of chatting before, I actually think that the drug manufacturers actually know about withdrawal. Um, I think of they, course they do this before they released the product. I don't think this was just some mistake uh, and that greed got away um, and that there's talk within the, the withdrawal communities that, that they actually do have a product that is supposed to mitigate SSRI withdrawal. I haven't seen it yet, but it wouldn't surprise me that they have a bill <laughs> for us. I'm sorry, I would draw. Don't take it if they release it. I would. That, that would be the last thing. Right, right. It's just like you know. Uh, I mean, we see that we see this go over. We see this <laughs> over and over again with their industry. Right. So what do they do? Purdue Pharma gets everybody addicted to oxycodone, right. oxycodone, That's and then right. what do they do? They come out with with nasal, nasal naloxone to, right. to, to save all the people that are overdosed from Oxycontin. That's you can't right. make this up. You yeah. cannot make this story up. I mean, it is the evils of big pharma. We're in bizarro land. It doesn't and, and they use those, I don't know if you know, but they use the same drug reps that were going around selling Oxycontin. They use those same drug reps to sell naloxone. Un unbelievable. Criminal. <laughs> you almost can't believe it. Anyway, go ahead. To not be legal. <laughs> yeah, right, right. And all, all of it made legal by the FDA. Yep. Our federal government says it's it's safe and effective and legal. It's unreal. It is unreal. And we we could talk about the people that are responsible for the opioid epidemic are the same people that are responsible for the SSRI epidemic. So, of course. Yep. Okay. So if you go to a mainstream doctor or psychiatrist, so so let me back up. Most SRI scripts are written by primary care physicians. Um, yes, people go to psychiatrists. Yes, that happens too. But the bulk of them are by PCPs that have no training in psychiatry or mental health. And there's almost never any follow-up. <laughs> can, can I back up on that too or, or add a little? Yeah. 
So back when these were getting popular, I was in pharmacy school. And you, you'll know this, and you can you can talk on this. Um, PCPs, family practice, internal medicine doctors, they weren't really allowed, not allowed. They were allowed to prescribe medications for depression, but they didn't usually do it. Yep. They figured it was something that they wanted to send to a psychiatrist because yep. it was, you know, a bigger problem. And then all of a sudden, everybody was qualified to prescribe yep. antidepressants because you, you got to increase access. You, right. you, you have to increase access for these people. We got to increase access. Does this sound like vaccines? Yeah. Let's get the pharmacist trained to give vaccines. So you can increase yep. access so people don't die. Yes. I mean, the, the story goes over yes. and over and over again. Yes. So that's how PCP doctors started prescribing SSRI. Okay. That's a really good point. And, um, and I think their playbook is small. I think they just keep using these techniques. <laughs> You're right. Their playbook is small. Yeah, it is. Right. It's the same thing over and over. It really is. And so you'd think right. that at some point we'd be like, hey, trust these people. Look what they did with tobacco. Look how these <laughs> pregnant women smoked cigarettes. It was perfectly fine. Right. It's the, anyways. So what this is the big exciting thing. So there's there's the horrific nature of withdrawal. If you listen to a mainstream person or, um, or you listen to this whole movement of hundreds of thousands of people um, on the Internet sharing their horrific stories. Right. But now we also have um, MDs, PhDs, people who are writing books. The, the One of the things about social media, because I've been following this for 12 to 13 years SSR I would draw before we had people on Instagram who were coming out, speaking out. So what I'm seeing now is very exciting. We have people with lived experience. We have coaches, we have doctor, right? We have renegade psychiatrists who are no longer prescribing. They're only helping with deep prescribing. So something's happening. Um, but first what I, what I want to say, and this just deserves repeating is that I'm not telling anybody to stop taking an SSRI you know, I wouldn't say consult with your doctor that prescribed it if they're, <laughs> right. <laughs> they're probably going to give you wrong information on how to taper. Um, but this is very serious. Number one, you should never, ever, ever, ever cold turkey. You should always taper. Um, if you've been on the drug less than six months, you could probably get away with cold turkey if and only if none of your detox pathways are stagnant or clogged, which is not most Americans. Most Americans have some form of toxic uh, burden, toxic load. Um, we can get to that later. But if you've been on this drug more than six months, you need to taper. And that's what I'm going to explain how to do. So what we do know through science. Um, so Dr. Mark Horowitz, I'm going to mention him multiple times. So he's an MD. He has six different degrees. He was trained at Ivy League schools. He's based in the UK. He now has his own tapering clinic, but it was his lived experience of being on an SSRI for more than 20 years and having literal horrific withdrawal that was debilitating that allowed him to do this research uh, and come out with with these tapering protocols so he's one of the main voices so much honor to like and he has been like smear campaigns lost colleagues like people have thrown him through the ringer but he has he has academic training, academic research, academic articles, now a book that I'm going to show y'all, um, and lived experience of almost dying from, from withdrawal. So, um, so it's people like him that are coming out that I think we're really going to turn this ship around. Um, so the thing, the thing I want your listeners to understand is that SSRIs, um, and specifically we were talking about Celexa and Effexor are, are, are um, Selexa and Cymbalta are basically the same thing, um, <laughs> different marketing, right? Yeah. But um, those are like the three that are like notorious to get off of. Lexapro is two. Prozac has the longest half life of all SSRIs. Right. I was going to mention that it's got it's got norfluoxetine as, a, as an active half life in fluoxetine. Yes, and it's got it's a half life of nineteen days. So that's why it's a little bit easier to get off of because right. it, it, it's. It, yeah, it's longer half life. You can taper off of that one easier, and oftentimes, if somebody is in a horrific um, withdrawal experience, they'll do what's called a Prozac taper or a Prozac bridge, where at the last um, few milligrams, they'll introduce Prozac if if you're on a drug that has a very short half life. So, okay, so we're putting SSRIs in terms of tapering and withdrawal um, in the same classes as um, heroin. 
opioids and methadone, meaning that you cannot taper in a linear way. You cannot just go do, 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 down in a, in a linear fashion. It has to be hy- hyperbolic, hyperbolic, which means it's in a curve because the last two milligrams of an SSRI taper are the hardest in terms of withdrawal. You would think, oh, I get down to two milligrams. It's, yeah. it's not going to have as much of an effect. It's the opposite. That, that is when you're going to see the most debilitating withdrawal symptoms is the last two milligrams. And so the way that th- through people's trial and error, not through the drug companies loving us and, and wanting us to be healthy and well <laughs> off these medications, what we've learned is, and this is backed by research articles that I'm, that I'm happy to share, is that the hyperbolic tapering protocols are what, what can finally liberate somebody from these drugs. And the way that works is you take the starting dose, you make a cut five to 10%. Mm -hmm. You can get away with higher cuts at the higher dosing. So if somebody's on 150 milligrams of Zoloft, right, you could probably get away with 10 to 15% cuts, right? Um, And you're going to hold at that dose for three to four weeks. Then you make another cut five to 10%, right? Um, As you're doing this, if any withdrawal symptoms. So we work with different withdrawal symptom checklists of things to work, work uh, look for or be aware of that, that physiologically could be changing in the body. If there's any changes physiologically or mood wise, you don't make any more cuts. You hold there, uh, which means that if somebody has been on um, an SSRI for 20 or 30 years, your taper is going to take years. I've met people who have tapered for five to 10 years, but that's because the first time or the second time or the third time they tried either cold turkey or tapering too fast, they were debilitated and could not work, lose their job, lose their family, like that, right? And so um, people don't want to hear this. Once people wake up to the truth about the toxins, these these are neurotoxins. These These are the equivalent to the lobotomy, in my opinion. This is the modern day lobotomy. This is causing brain injuries. And that's what so many people will tell you once they withdraw um, or are in what's called protracted withdrawal, uh, they'll tell you, I feel like I have a brain injury. I I can't think, I can't plan and reason, right? The the words won't come out. And the, the good news is, is that brain injury is temporary. It's not permanent. The nervous system can heal from this with the proper nutritional supports. Um, So let's just say we're doing this hyperbolic tapering and we're doing it very conservatively and very slowly. Then we get down to the last two milligrams, right? So at this point, things have to be so methodical. So up until this point, people are either shaving they're either getting with a razor blade, they're they're cutting the the cap, not the capsule, the um, the tablet, in, in, and measuring it. Right, that's how we usually coach people. If if you're lucky enough to be on a drug that um, there's a liquid version, then by all means, of course they put weird sucralose and stuff in it. But I would say it's probably better to just do that because you can get the des- the dose so exact. Um, I work with people as, who, as a compounding pharmacist. Yeah, I'm that's gonna what say, I was going to say. I was going to say you could use a compounding pharmacist to make yeah. exact dosing totally. with, with no bad fillers, no bad colors, no, none of that stuff. Yeah, so. that was what I was just going to say. Is that if you're also lucky enough to be in the area of a compounding pharmacy, I work with people um, that they're willing to oversee the tapering process that way. Um, I've worked with people who were tapering from. Um, Cymbalta or things that that are in capsules that have beads, and these people are literally taking out one bead at a time. Wow! Wow! It's insane. It's like Breaking Bad. It's like a chemistry session yeah. <laughs> of trying to withdraw. It, it also tells you how potent those drugs really are. That's what I'm saying. These are mind altering psychoactive drugs. Um, and so I will say this, that I've seen people get down to the two milligrams and not be able to taper. There are some people, sadly, and my, my hope is that 10 years from now, we'll figure out what that the piece to this puzzle is um, and, ha- and be able to help everybody taper all the way off. But if you've been on the drug for like 20 years... I would say that if you're, if you're struggling even with the slow taper, that sometimes it's better to just stay on that two milligrams than to be completely disabled. 
And I wish that wasn't a statement. I could, I wish that that wasn't true. Um, but that is what I've seen is that some people's nervous systems just can't tolerate the withdrawals. You know, we had a podcast the other day with uh, Dr. Sean Baker. And if you're not familiar with him, <clears throat> of course you are. Yeah. Because <laughs> you believe in, in diet over drugs to, to treat. I, and I disease. believe in meat for mental health. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, just, you know, good food, exercise and sleep is going to fix most of our problems. Yes. Um, one thing that he said, and I just think about how sad it is that somebody's going to have to be on a drug the rest of their life, even if it's only two milligrams of, of some SSRI. One thing he talked about is, you know, one of our goals in our podcast, one of his goals is to empower patients, you know, to empower people to take charge of their own health, right? How disempowering is it that you're going to have to take a drug the rest of your life? That's, that's, right. dis that's very disempowering. That's right. It's, it's a sad. And, 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 you know, you kind of, you, you did allude, you said this. I think the drug companies knew about this. I think they knew about how hard it was to get off of them. And I mean, what a better drug to start somebody on that the government has approved as safe and effective and they can put you on this and you could never go off of it without getting sick. Right. I mean, yep. I mean, they, they've got a perfect drug. They it's, really, like, it's, like, it's like legal heroin. That's exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. And if, if I didn't know any better, I'd also wonder if there were kind of some spiritual ramifications here too, because I, I do, because there's a blunting of affect, because there is a disconnection from your emotions. I think that these drugs disconnect you from your spirit or your true nature. Right. And, and that goes into a whole other can of worms. We're not going to go into today. Um, but I also want to say, and we do have research to show that um, the amount of gaslighting that happens to pregnant women. So I've seen this because I, I specialize in perinatal mental health. I work with uh, pregnancy, postpartum, the whole gamut of a woman's life. And uh, 50 milligrams of Zoloft is standard of care. If you're not feeling like yourself, the six month visit, right? So we're, we're getting women at the postpartum period where their hormones and sleep are altered significantly yeah. and they don't have a tribe or a village to come and support them, right? So we're just going to throw an SSRI at it to make you feel better, which actually causes um, thyroid conditions, which is very common in postpartum women, um, but, but pregnant women, right? So I've worked with hundreds of women who we get them through the postpartum era, um, you know, through therapy, they're given the 50 milligrams of Zoloft. They call me a year or two later. They're like, I want to have a second baby, but I cannot get off this Zoloft. What do I do? Uh, and the psychiatrist is in their ear saying, it's perfectly fine to take this while you're pregnant. And I'm in their ear saying it's actually not perfectly fine <laughs> because we have research studies that have connected autism, ADHD, learning disabilities, right? Cognitive dysfunction in the offspring of, of women who've taken SSRIs during pregnancy. So the gaslighting is it's going to be more dangerous to you if you have a depressive episode while you're pregnant than if you just stay on the dose that you're at, which is actually, it's, that's false. That's a lie. That's not true. <laughs> um, <laughs> Unreal. It's, it's unreal. So, and then, and then what's happening to children, right. With these kinds of medications. So we're, we're seeing a whole generation that's being put on these medications. I mean, I've seen scripts as early as three years old for an SSRI, which is insanity. So let's just say somebody's on this while their nervous system is developing. So the, <laughs> we have no idea. I don't know if those people will ever be able to stop. Um, one thing I also want to say, and then I want to go through, like, what are the withdrawal symptoms? How, what, what do you do if you find yourself in post-acute withdrawal, meaning you've taken your last dose and, and the bottom has fallen out? Um, and what do you do if you're in the middle of a taper and withdrawal kicks in? For the, for the SSRIs that have a long half-life, withdrawal can kick in. Um, I've seen it a month to four months after your last dose. So you feel fine after that last dose and then some time passes and every, the bottom drops out. Your, your total insomnia can't eat, can't sleep, right? It, it just debilitating suicidality. So that's one of the main withdrawal symptoms is extreme, like not just regular suicidality, like, oh, I just wish I wasn't here. I'm talking like suicidality on steroids where it's literally the only thing you can think about 24 hours a day. Uh, you can see visual images of it. I mean, it, 
<laughs> it is dark. Um, so what we, what I do in my practice is to try and help people avoid that. Right. Um, it's better if people come to me for tapering support before they've started tapering, because there's just so much bad information out there. Um, but if you get to a point in the taper and you start to experience withdrawal, what, what we do is recommend a micro reinstatement. So we're going to go back up to not the whole starting dose, but we're going to go at, back to the 5% that you were just on what, where your nervous system was stable. And this can mitigate withdrawal symptoms, right? So that's just kind of how we've landed. Um, sometimes people get overzealous and they get impulsive and they're like, I'm feeling great. I'm just going to keep pushing through. I'm going to do 20 milligram cut or 20% cut, right? And so I want to just read the list of what can happen when the nervous system goes into psychiatric psychiatric drug withdrawal. Psychiatric drug withdrawal lasts more than two weeks. There was this campaign in the UK that tried to say hashtag two, uh, two weeks, right? It, it is way longer than two weeks because mainstream doctors will say, oh, but drugs of abuse, you know, street drugs, they, the withdrawal doesn't last more than two weeks. So it can't, there's no way it could happen with an SSRI. I've met people in post-acute withdrawal who've been in withdrawal for years. Uh, I met one lady who was literally had withdrawal symptoms for 10 years uh, that uh, it impacted her ability to function. Um, so akathasia is, is at the top of the list because this drives people to killing themselves. There is a, a, a big portion of people in SSRI withdrawal that end up just killing themselves because it's so horrific. And akathasia is a, it's, it's hard to describe if you've never experienced it, but it's literally, it's like you feel like you're crawling out of your skin it's this inner restlessness. People are often seen pacing back and forth. They cannot sit still. It's, it's worse than anxiety. Uh, and it literally drives people to take their own lives. Um, extreme panic. So the, the typical way we know when somebody's going into withdrawal is they wake up with uh, no apparent reason. It's not just anxiety. It's panic. Um, and we know that the HPA access is severely altered uh, by the SSRI. And then when you start taking away the SSRI, so we get the um, cortisol spikes, the norepinephrine, the adrenaline, right, that are already in the morning. But then when you're in withdrawal, it's like times 100. Um, hormone imbalances. This is very big in men and women. Um, significant. I've seen women lose their periods even while they're still eating. Um, adrenal fatigue, sensory disturbances. This is where it does start to look like a, a street drug. I was going to say, this sounds like cocaine withdrawal. It's yeah. I mean, people like sounds like normal sounds will feel like you're piercing somebody, you know, through the eardrum. Um, so sounds, smells, and scent, uh, sight are all like extremely hypersensitive. The extreme suicidality, depersonalization, where people feel like they're literally not in their body, uh, mania. Brain fog, poor focus, extreme irritability, extreme insomnia. I've met people that like literally didn't sleep for days and weeks on end uh, and extreme GI issues. So I see a wealth of candida issues, candida overgrowth, fungal overgrowth in people in my practice who are tapering. Um, I wanted to run this by you. I mean, my theory is that uh, at least the SSRI is really all the psychotropics are are eroding the epithelial tissue of the gut lining that they're somehow causing leaky gut i don't know for sure but it just it's a speculation that there are so many people with gut issues who've been on these drugs <laughs> it's astounding. pharmacologically speaking i don't know the details behind that but it doesn't surprise me at all um there may be some kind of secondary thing going on that you know, I, I don't know about, um, yeah. but the bottom line is they're not good for your health. That's the not. And, and they destroy most people's gut health. Um, oh, this is another important piece. When I'm working with somebody who's tapering, 
We also address any trauma from their childhood, um, any trauma from the medical system, right? We, we need to address the trauma at the nervous system level as you're tapering because these drugs, just like alcohol, their central nervous system squelching, they're, they're, they're shutting Present. down this C- CNS depressants. Feedback, right? Yeah. This feedback to the rest of your body. Um, when you start to lower the dose, you get more access to all of these emotions that have been numbed and blunted, um, including your trauma. And so it behooves us to kind of address some of that emotional baggage um, prior to the taper. We don't always get the luxury of doing that, um, but it, it, people need or people must change their diet while they're tapering. Some people are resistant to it and they won't do it until they hit withdrawal. And then when you're in withdrawal, you have no choice. You cannot eat dairy, sugar, gluten, alcohol, I mean, those are the top four that I see across the board in hundreds of people. You cannot eat like that anymore. You cannot eat an inflammatory diet, period. You can't. It's going to sabotage the taper. It's not going to work. So many people I've met in protracted withdrawal cannot eat sugar, dairy, gluten. I mean, you just or alcohol for the rest of their lives. So it alters something in our metabolism, uh, in the endocrine system. It's altering things. It's not just in the brain. It's in all of the organs. Um, okay. One more thing I want to just kind of make sure that everybody is aware of. So we are getting these. So this is the book I wanted to, to show you. It's called the Maudley Deprescribing Guidelines. This is the Mark Horowitz. It's not just for SSRIs. It's benzos, gabapentin, and the Z drugs. So the sleep, sleep meds. Um, well-researched, tons and tons and tons of articles back this up, uh, but it basically gives you the layout of different tapering protocols. Um, This is a huge win. This is so exciting. I can't tell you how excited I was to receive this book, that this is happening in 2024. Um, But then we have other, so um, I highly recommend this one. It's called Mental Health Survivor Kit and Withdrawal from Psychiatric Drugs. Um, these are just my SSRI ones. I have more that are just on all of the Joseph Glenmullen is really good. He's got some good ones about, um, surviving withdrawal. Um, so we've got these people who are doing the research and and giving us the protocols then in the UK. And this is something I, I really want to advocate for this. And I don't know who, whose door I need to be knocking on in the UK. They have what's called tapering strips. So they're way that you get them from the pharmacist and their little strips. Now I, I would argue that their tapering protocol is too quick, but they basically help you cut the dose in the 10%. Um, and, and it's like, it's done for you. We don't have access to that in America. I, I got my theories on why, but I would love to see those in America. <laughs> now, some people just need to do a liquid taper. And I actually like, I think that the liquid taper is probably better, especially the lower you get in the dose. Um, but some people get addicted to, okay, it's not, we can't call it addiction. We can say ta- they develop tolerance um, because these are, they're definitely physiologically um dependent uh i would say psychologically as well um but these these tapering strips and the problem with the liquid is that sometimes they only make the liquid in the generic and if you've gotten not addicted but addicted to the the brand name you can't switch to generic people say oh it's the exact same it's actually not i mean it's just not i've seen it more than once there's something that's slightly different uh and it will sabotage it will send somebody into withdrawal if you switch to a generic uh mid taper like that so sometimes you're just bound um i do know people that and i don't recommend this but i do know people that have been desperate enough to um crush up the tablet and put it in water themselves and make it themselves i just think that's too risky especially if you're down to the lowest dose you need this needs to be a science experiment this needs to be so precise um and that uh, Mark Horowitz, the, the, the Bible of deep prescribing, right? He has a clinic, a tapering clinic uh, in the UK and England. There's, um, and again, I'm going to put these in the notes. Dr. Joseph um, 
Whit Doring has a tapering clinic in America. He has prescriptive abilities uh, in not all 50 states, but a lot of the states. Uh, and then there's the alternative to Med Center in Sedona, Arizona, which is an inpatient psychiatric drug withdrawal facility. They do all psychotropics. So we have these, right? We're the pioneers are building the resources yes. for alternatives and I could not be more excited. Like, and then a very quick pitch for what I'm doing. So this, this work is what I'm most passionate about is liberating people from this industry. And, um, I, in conjunction with my husband is my business partner for the farm, but we are starting up, um, an organic, eventually regenerative farm that is also going to be a psychotropic taper clinic. We're starting at the outpatient for tapering um, where you come onto the farm for three to four hours a day. We're doing group therapy work, which is really uh, lifestyle management. We're learning how to eat again properly for mental health. We're learning how to clear trauma out of the nervous system holistically. Um, we're learning how to work on an, an organic farm by doing different projects and how to heal the soil. Um, and people like me and other coaches who have lived experience, you're learning how to taper. And so um, that's what I'm gonna do with the rest of the time on this planet is, is, is build these opportunities for people to learn um, how to liberate themselves from this. Absolutely. Industry. And your website is organichealthcenter.com, organicmentalhealthcenter.com, correct? Yes. And we, we will have a, a website soon for the farm. So stay tuned. I'll be posting it on that website as well. That, that is so exciting. And, you know, one of the things that excites me the most is just the fact that we are talking about deep prescribing, which tells you that people know there's a problem in this country yes. with overutilization of drugs. Yes. You know, um, or we wouldn't even have that term deep prescribing. That's right. And, I had a pharmacist on our um, podcast and he specialized in deep prescribing. And, you know, we've seen this before. One of the reasons Jan and I stopped doing what we were doing in the traditional pharmacy sense is you, know, you see patients on 20 different medications. Yes. And I mean, easily they could go off 15 of them easily yeah. with, with no problems, you know. Yes. Um, ultimately, I'd like to see people get off all their all the pharmaceuticals, uh, you know, it's, it, you know, our, our drug, our, our bodies don't lack a drug. We don't have a drug deficiency that is put into our bodies. You know, yeah. we're, not, we're not created that way. Yes. So I'm going to put you on the spot, Kelly. Mm -hmm. What is the best antidepressant ever invented ever, ever, ever? There is nothing better. No drug better. Yeah. Hands down. And there's tons of research to support this, but it's exercise. Absolutely. Uh, and I will tell you personally, I've experienced it myself. You know, you're just not feeling, you're feeling down, call it depression, possibly whatever. Um, you're just not feeling great. And you go out and you do a kick butt workout. I mean, you're like, man, the world's, the world's a better place. Absolutely. It's, just, it's sad that somebody will go into a doctor's office. They'll say they're depressed and the doctor will prescribe a drug instead of saying, you know what? Why don't you get off your butt and start exercising? Absolutely. You know? Yeah. I mean, totally. seriously. Totally. And and the research says uh, exercise is done outside is even more powerful. <laughs> and, and, and why should that surprise us? I mean, come on. I, I, right. I, I mean, <laughs> you know, first of all, there's so many things that happen when we go into nature therapy yes. and, and, and we go outside that, you know, our bodies were created to be outside Absolutely. most of the time, I believe. But sunlight you know, helps, helps uh, vitamin D production on our skin, in our skin, um, neurotransmitters and so many things, you know, if, if, if depression does have to do with neurotransmitters, which it probably does somehow, but go outside, exercise, that'll stimulate dopamine. That'll stimulate norepinephrine. That'll stimulate epinephrine. That can't be a bad thing. Yeah. And that naturally without yeah. the withdrawal effects. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm getting to this point in my career where, cause I used to say, Oh, you know, depression is just trauma. That's, that's undigested. That's stuck in the nervous system. And that's true to some degree, but really what I think depression is, is um, macro and micronutrient deficiencies, uh, toxic burdens, right. And poor gut health. 
and maybe some, you know, adverse things that happened to you during your childhood. But I, I'm, I'm walking yeah. further away from it being psychological and, and, and more at the gut level, more issues with toxins, right? Well, we, we really look at what we've been eating for the last 30 years. Yeah. I mean, most of us have been eating crap food. If you're yeah. not eating good food, why should we be surprised people are depressed? Right. You know, and then right. you go into a, a you know a traditional doctor to verify. Yep, you got depression. You got a drug deficiency. Here's yeah. Prozac. Then yeah. you you know it even it even accelerates that thought in your mind that you know, um, you know why not change your diet? I mean seriously. Yeah. So go ahead, Kelly. That's that's the hard work with people is getting them is. to change their diet and exercise and sleep. That's my hardest part of my job. <laughs> not. <laughs> But you know what? childhood adversity right it's getting people to change their lifestyle yeah. it's so hard true um but when we share the truth of these drugs and the right. side effects they cause and you realize that if you start these drugs you may never ever go off of them ever yeah. that can be a pretty powerful statement somebody's like wow. and that, that's true informed consent and that's what needs to be happening in doctors' offices right. when these scripts are being written is, is actual informed consent. That's what I'm advocating for. If you want to take the drugs and you know the risks, yeah, and the risks absolutely. by all means. I'm not saying don't. I just want you to know that they're really hard to stop. <laughs> yeah, right. So, Kelly, as we wrap this podcast up, um, what do you have a passion for? Well, organic and holistic farming. I mean, this is the other thing I wanted to say is that, you know, starting up a farm is monumental. We have 75 acres. We're, we're learning as we go. And I have my days of, of doubt, right? Of like, I don't know if I can do this. This is so big. I'm, you know, starting this whole thing. But when I go out on that farm and I do projects where I'm lifting things and pulling up weeds and moving things around, my hope is restored. <laughs> yeah, right. It, it, we have cows right now. So when I'm taking care of the animals, when I'm out there, I, I remember this is why I'm here. So sadly, this the farmland, that was, it's been in my family for 100 years, but it was subleased out to conventional farmers. So I learned all about Bayer, which is a pharmaceutical company, has ravaged the soil that we're healing through glyphosate, Roundup, and GMO seed. So I'm learning um, how to heal soil. Uh, and that is not through more chemicals. That is through um, poop of cows. Right, right. The way they did it thousands of years ago. <laughs> Which is, you know, there's a smear campaign on cow farts right now. Whatever. I know. I know what I'm seeing on the land and what's happening. So, um, but passionate about healing soil and 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 liberating humans to live chemical free lives. So we're doing that with the land and with the people that come on it. So. And, I, and thank you for doing that. That sounds so exciting. I would love to hear more about it. And, you know, as you up, you can update us and be back on our podcast. Um, yes. Speaking of cows, you know, I actually got into a debate with a doctor the other day. A very smart guy. <laughs> um, Harvard and Mayo Clinic and Stanford trained. That's part of the problem. That is part of the problem. It's an indoctrination camp. Uh, absolutely. I mean, usually the smarter the people, look at COVID, the yeah. smarter the people, the more they drink the Kool-Aid. Yep. Most healthcare professionals bought the whole COVID scam. Yeah. Um, and, and they're the most educated. Yep. So it was easy for because you know, we, we want to trust the science. Well, I don't trust anybody anymore. No. But anyway, he doesn't believe in eating red meat because you know, all the studies with good cardiovascular health shows that you know, eating a plant-based diet is what's better for us. And I just asked him, he's a believer too. And I asked him, I said, Do you really think that Cows would be created for us to right. eat, and they'd be bad for us. Right. And as humans, we've been doing it for thousands of years, eating cows. Yep. It didn't kill us. Yeah. I mean, seriously. I, I mean, that, that's, just, that's just crazy. I know. Um, you it's know, crazy. but whether, either, you know, insert XYZ drug into this, into this equation. But yet, XYZ drug is going to save us, and it's been around for 70 years. No. I mean, come on. I, I'm with you and there's something weird going on in our culture about meat right now. And I think that's intentional because I think they know if they take away the meat, our brains won't function properly. I'm a believer myself and I believe that our creator <laughs> gave us these gifts and, and, and actually uh, liver, kidney, the organ meats, right, of an animal are what can really help people in a, in a taper. Uh, well, 
That's like uh, multivitamin. That is sure. a vitamin A, vitamin D, highly concentrated in organ meat. Absolutely. Yeah. Everything that is needed. Um, and, you know, I, as a believer, I really think that what, what this industry is doing is practicing pharmacia. And again, that's for a whole other podcast, yeah. but it's, it's real. I see it every day and, uh, and I'm here to, you know, offer solutions to it. Um, and, and on the meat thing too, it's like, let, let's just look at history. We talked a little bit about history, how it repeats itself. Well, let's just look at thousands of years, you know, hundreds of hundreds of years, hundreds of years, thousands of years. What did the Kings eat and what did they feed the peasants? <laughs> They, yep. fed the, they fed the peasants, you know, barley, wheat, Grain. you know, plants, Grain. <laughs> and, and, right? And the kings ate meat. Yep. Do, do, do I need to say more? Yep. The yep. only time the kings would feed people meat were the gladiators that they wanted to fight and be strong. Mm-hmm. That's the only, that's the only ones that they, they gave meat to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is that, so if you want to be, if you want to be weak, keep right. eating plants right. and don't eat meat. Right. Yeah. I'm, no. I'm with you. <laughs> That's a whole other podcast. I know so. it is, but uh, it's important. It's important for people's mental health. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Kelly, as we wrap this podcast up, how is the best way for people to get a hold of you? Uh, my contact page on organicmentalhealthcenter.com. That would probably be the best way. I welcome any feedback. If anybody wants resources or recommendations in terms of different centers, please reach out. Um, or if anybody wants to talk about collaboration with the the healing center we're creating, um, I welcome that. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Kelly, you've helped us realize our goal, which is to educate and empower people to take charge of their own health. That's exactly what we're talking about today. So thank you so much for doing that. Thank you for allowing me to speak. (laughs) And and hang on after the podcast. I want to chat with you offline. Okay. Listeners and viewers, thank you for joining the Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham. Um, Tune in next week. Um, We will actually be in Moab. We're headed to Moab tomorrow for uh, uh, Moab Rocks three state. Uh, three-day stage race in Moab. We won't be having a podcast Monday because I will be in the middle of a race during the podcast, our regularly scheduled podcast. But stay tuned. We'll be um, recycling some episodes. Um, As always, thank you for following Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham. Thank you. 